you'll please take the Word of God. I want you to turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That's Jesus Christ, one who died for all, and we are the all dead, spiritually. And that he died for all, Jesus Christ, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now this is talking about believers. Now that we know him, we don't live for ourselves, we live for him. That's what he desires. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're going to look at that little phrase here at the end of verse 17. that says, all things are become new. All things are become new. Father, please take your word tonight. Help us because we surely need it. We cannot understand the spiritual truth from your word in our flesh. Would you help us to be yielded to you tonight? Would you guide us in our thoughts? Help us to be still in our soul? Because the truth of tonight's message, we need to live every day. And I pray you'll guide us in this tonight. Guide my words, guide our thoughts, guide the way we respond to your word tonight, that you might be honored and glorified in it. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We started looking at last Sunday night, the motto of our church, and it is a church family striving to be all the Lord saved us to be. Believe, become, belong. Believe, become, belong. The Lord saved us to be a lot. And if we're going to be all that He saved us to be, we have to believe, we have to become, and we have to belong. And so the last message, we emphasized what it meant to be a believing church, to be a believing individual. And we said that believing is trusting and placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is believing what the Lord says and then acting on it. There, there will naturally become actions out of your faith. Faith is treating what the Lord says as true even before it happens. If not, then it's just sight. But we trust the Lord for it, and we see the Lord bring it to pass. So when I say that we need to be a believing church, I'm saying that we need to trust the Lord 100% with all things. That's what He desires from our life. That in every area of our life, He has our trust. And that we believe that He is able to do that. The Christian life cannot be separated from faith. There is no substitute for trusting the Lord. There's nothing you can do. Coming to church is not a substitute for trusting the Lord. Reading your Bible is not a substitute for trusting the Lord. Praying is not a substitute for trusting the Lord. None of that is a substitute. Nothing can substitute. But now if you are trusting the Lord, you should come to church. You should read your Bible. You should be praying. You should be witnessing to people. All those things that are supposed to happen will happen as we trust the Lord. But sometimes we say, well, we're doing all these things, but we don't have faith. So we need to evaluate. We ask, need to ask the Lord to help us evaluate ourselves and be honest with us. And we be honest back with the Lord as He reveals those things to us. Are we believing? Now, the emphasis tonight is going to be on becoming what the Lord desires for us to be. And, well, that happens when we believe. Believe, become, belong. Now, we are becoming what the Lord wants us to become. And when we talk about becoming something, we're talking about becoming something new, which implies some kind of change in life. We're becoming something. Specifically, today, 
We are talking about being changed and becoming what the Lord has saved us to become. Others should know that we believe the Lord and that we believe His Word and that we're becoming what He saved us to be. Do others know that about us? If they know us, do they know that person believes in the Lord, Jesus Christ? That person believes God's Word. You know what? God is actually working in their life. He's changing them. And we should be quick to let people know that. You haven't arrived. I haven't arrived. He's still working on us. And He's changing us. What are we believing today? But what we're believing is what we will be becoming tomorrow. What we're believing today. Be careful what you believe. Because that's what you're going to become. And we don't become what the Lord saved us to become by just simply coming to church. I know some people think that. If we can just get to church and sit in the pew, somehow, miraculously, we're going to leave here without any effort on our own or any faith of our own, and we're going to be so much the better when we leave. Now, when the Lord speaks to you, if you respond right, you can be. Now, be careful because when you come to church and you hear the Word of God and you say no to God... You maybe shouldn't even have come to church. And I don't like to say that as a pastor, but you're going to be worse off when you leave than when you come. If God speaks to you and you say, nah, no, nah, I don't need that. In my, I don't want you to do that in my life. Isn't that going a little bit far? Okay, when you say no to the Lord, then you're going to leave here worse. You know, we become what the Lord saved us to become by yielding to Him and saying yes to Him. I like to tell the Lord, when I come to any service, when I come to His Word, show me something. Whatever you show me, yes. Yes. Could we just have that attitude? Whatever you show me, yes. Whatever you want me to do, yes. Now, is there ever a time that doesn't happen? Sure it is. I'm flesh like your flesh. Saved, saved in flesh, but still the same. Our flesh is flesh. But we need to yield to Him. I'm going to give you some simple truths about becoming in the Word of God. This is the first point. I only got two. Everybody said, hmm, hmm. Okay, simple truths about becoming in the Word of God. I want you to look at Malachi 3.6. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. I want you to understand this. The Lord never changes. This is a good principle for you to get, grasp, believe, impart into your life. The Lord never changes. Verse 6 of Malachi chapter 3 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He says a similar thing in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. And it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday today and forever. So if he's the same yesterday and today and forever, that means he does what? He doesn't change. So mark it down that the Lord is consistent and therefore our faith can be consistent. We don't have to wonder. I often think, Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to change the whole script on me. And it's going to be something different tomorrow. He's going to be the same. He never changes. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12. The Lord must give us the power to become a son of God. This is the truth about becoming in the word of God. He has to give us the power. Now what does John 1 12 say? But as many as received him, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So how do you receive the Son of God? You believe on his name. Receiving and believing is what you need to do toward the person of Jesus Christ by faith. You need to believe him and receive him. And the Bible says that he gives you the power to become a son of God. When a person believes and receives Jesus as their Savior, they're given the privilege by the Lord's power 
to become his child. 1 John chapter 5, in verse, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, that's talking about eternal life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, that's talking about not having eternal life. So you can only have the Son or not, and have eternal life or not have it. There's no in-between. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. He gives us the power to become a Son of God. We are not saved or changed into a child of God by our own power. It's not going to happen. But we become a child of God through His power as we believe and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's the truth about becoming in the Word of God. There is no other way to become a child of God. Then in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 20, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says, For our conversation is in heaven. Of course, Paul's writing the inspired word of God here to the Philippian church, which is a group of believers. So he's saying, as for me and for you, our conversation is in heaven because there are children of God uh, by faith in him. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he's coming. If they're looking for him, he's coming. And he said they should be looking. Who, that's referring to the Lord, shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So the Lord will change our vile bodies. The Lord never changes. We have to become a child of God by his power through faith. But when he comes back, he's going to change our vile bodies. The Lord expects us as believers to be looking for His return, we find in verse 20. The Bible also tells us that in Titus chapter 2. I wonder, are you looking for His return? Do you believe He's even coming back? He's promised. Verse 13 and 14 of Titus chapter 2 says this, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity, not just some of it, all of it, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Part of what he's doing is he's putting in us to be looking for him because he's coming back. And as we look for his return, it changes us to be more like him and to be pure in our daily lives. We find that in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, look at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That's a good thought. Not tomorrow. Right now, we are. We were. If you were saved yesterday, you were. Today, you are right now. When tomorrow comes, we are right now, the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, the Lord, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope, what hope? He's coming back. If you have this hope, in you, or in him, the Bible says, purifieth himself even as he is pure. So this truth about Jesus coming back teaches us in our hearts to be pure because he's coming back at any moment. We don't know. The moment might be a year from now. It might be 10 years from now. It might be tonight. But the moment is coming when he's coming back. And it says we'll be pure even as he is pure. That will be our desire. doesn't mean we'll be sinless, but it means that we'll be letting Him work in us, and we'll be acknowledging where we're fa failures and letting Him help us. The Lord, when He comes, will change our vile bodies to be like His. And we'll be becoming exactly what He wants us to be. You know what that'll be? Perfect. We won't have a sin nature anymore. <laughs> what a wonderful day that's going to be. I won't have to struggle with it anymore. You won't have to struggle with it anymore. So simple truths about becoming in the Word of God. But we also find some simple truths about becoming what the Lord saved us to be. So he's making us. He's not changing. We're becoming the sons of God by faith. We are going to become just like him, not God, but we'll be like him without sin, new glorified body. 
in heaven one day. That's wonderful. Anybody else think so? Amen. Okay, a few of you. Very good. Now, these truths, what has the Lord saved us to be? What is He trying to do in our lives? Well, these truths that we're about to look at take place between the time that we became a son of God by His power and the time when the Lord changes our vile bodies when we're taken to be with Him. And this period between our salvation and our glorification is sanctification. And that's what we're living in right now. And you're living in. And this is that time of becoming what the Lord wants us to become. He is sanctifying us or setting us apart to Him to be used by Him. And so the Lord wants all things in our life to become new. We already read the verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 where He says all things are become new. Let's go back there real quick and I'll read that whole verse here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's something you have to ask yourself tonight. Are you in Christ? You don't want to be found out of him. Are you in him by faith? Have you become a child of God by faith? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That is absolute. There's no question marks there. You might be a new creature. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become New. So when we trusted the Lord as our Savior, we were made new creatures, and two things happened. First, the Lord sees us as not being bound to sin because our sin nature is passed away, or the sin nature that held us in bondage has been broken. We don't have to yield to that anymore in our life. The word old is referring to our original sin nature and its desires. The phrase pass away means to depart, pass away, or pass from. This phrase is in the aorist tense, which I know doesn't make sense to any of you, but I'm going to tell you that it means that it happened at a point in time by Jesus Christ. Aorist tense means this. There's a point in time where that thing happened. Okay? And that's what's happening here. The old things have passed away. This is telling us that our bondage to our sin nature and the sinful desires it wanted us to carry out was broken at the time of salvation. It was broken. We no longer have to be in bondage and enslaved to sin anymore. That's what Jesus Christ did for us at the time of salvation. Now look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. I would be, if I were you, I'd be just as excited about that as I am that my vile body is going to be changed. Because that means that you don't have to yield to that anymore. I don't have to yield to that anymore. That was one of the exciting things in my Christian life when I got saved at 19 out of a life of sin. I could never stop the things that I was trying to stop, but when I got saved and I realized that I didn't have to do those things anymore and that Christ set me free, whew, that was a good day. I didn't have to do them anymore. He gave me power over them. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Biblical liberty is when Jesus Christ makes us free from the bondage of sin. It's not liberty to sin. It's liberty not to sin. This is the liberty he's saying we stand fast in because Jesus has made it possible that we don't sin because he hates sin. And that's what he wants us to stand in. And so he's... he's, uh, He's broken this bond for us. Now, secondly, the Lord now sees us as being completely righteous because we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The word become, if we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, become is in the perfect tense. Now, that's different than the aorist tense, which is a point in time. This thing was broken. Our bondage was broken. But the Perfect tense means that it happened at a point in time by Jesus Christ and the results continue on forever. So when he put this, when he made us a new creature, that also happened at a point in time, but the results from that just keep going and going and going and going. That new creature continues on and the old man is broken. We have victory over him. The word new is referring to our new nature, our spirit that's been made alive, that was dead before we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
is made alive in our new godly desires that we have. That's what the new is talking about. This is telling us that our liberty to live a holy life and obey the Lord was given to us at the time of salvation. This new desire will be one to go on for all eternity. It will never stop. It will only be perfected when we come into the very presence of God and we have a glorified body without a sin nature. That's wonderful. How do we live in this new nature or desires that we have? Because the Bible did say, don't put yourself back in bondage. So although the bondage has been broken, if you want to go put yourself back in bondage to the flesh, you just go get in sin. And then you just say yes to sin again, and you say yes to sin again, and you're, and you're putting yourself back in the bondage. It doesn't have victory over you anymore because Jesus is greater than he who's in us. Uh, the Holy Spirit is greater than he's in the world. He's greater than our flesh. And so we don't have to go back. But how do we, how do we live in this new man? And that's the key to becoming what the Lord wants you to become. It's by yielding to the Lord. I want you to go to Romans chapter 6 with me. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. That's a, that's a choice you have to make. Don't let sin reign in your body. It has no business reigning in the believer's life. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. All that goes together. So he's saying if you yield to your flesh and your carnal fleshly desires then you're going to commit unrighteousness. But in contrast to that, yield yourselves unto God and, and as those that are alive from the dead. We're spiritually alive. We can be yielded to God and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So sin doesn't have rule over you. We shouldn't let sin rule over us. When the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and tells us to do something, and we do it, then we're yielding to the Lord. Some people say, well, how do you do that? How do you yield? I think you know. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you about something, and you do it, you yield to Him on it, and you do that thing. Now, when, you, uh, when our sin nature tells us to do something and we do it, then we're yielding to our sin nature. And we know, I think you would know, when your sin nature is telling you to do something and you yield to it. You're saying yes to it. You're giving way to it. So we can either place ourselves back under bondage to sin or we can place ourselves in liberty to righteousness. But this is the continual battle that you and I face daily. So by yielding to the Lord, we can walk in the new man, but by re also by renewing our minds. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, you said we already hear these verses. We know these verses. Yes, but we still fail. The last time you failed and you gave way to your sin and your, your flesh, you forgot these Bible verses. And so did I. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That means we're yielded to Him. If we're doing His good and acceptable and perfect will, we're living in, in the new desires of the new nature that we have, the new creature that we've been made, and it's by the renewing of our mind. The Bible tells us that we are not to be conformed to this world or the time in which we live, the things around us, the system of this world. We don't have to be held captive to that but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renewing means to be completely changed. We need our minds changed. I don't need my mind to be helped. I don't need it to be a better sinful mind. Right? I need it to be completely changed. Because in, in and of myself, what I trained myself for 19 years to think and act and do was sinful. Christ has completely got to... Rework that. 
and help my mind to think in righteousness. We will never be transformed until we have renewed the way we process the information that we receive in a biblical, righteous way. There are two things that will help the most with renewing the way we process information. The Word of God, you need to get into it, and then get into it, and then get into it, have it to get into you, and then faith. You trust it. You take it in, you meditate on it, you believe it. You pray it. You talk to God about it as you're reading it. Lord, help me in this area of my life. I believe you can do that. I see this in the Bible. I see myself here. I need you to help me in this in my life. Get into it. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God and faith is going to make all the difference in the world and us renewing our mind. And when our mind is renewed, it'll be easier for us to yield to him and to have victory over the flesh that we're no longer in bondage to. But the world is enticing us all the time to give way to it. So the Lord wants us to become servants. These are some things the Lord wants for us. He wants all things in our life to be made new, but He wants us to become servants. Look at back at Romans chapter 6 and verse 15 and following. Now you're going to see the comparison here between we used to serve sin, now we serve righteousness. And he wants us to be his servants. His servants. Verse 15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And the Lord said, God forbid. So just because he's forgiven us, he's not giving us a free license to go sin now. If anybody ever tells you that, run as far away from them as you can get. That is not what the grace of God in the Bible is, is about. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, were, past tense. Okay? You might want to circle that or whatever you need to do in your Bible. Ye were servants to, of, of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. That was me. That was you before we were saved. We were servants to sin. Now, we didn't see it that way until Jesus showed us. But I didn't see it that way. I thought I was a good guy. But when Jesus revealed to me that, I realized. Realized how sinful I was, and I was free from any righteousness, and I needed him and his righteousness. And the Bible says here, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? By the way, you ought to be ashamed of your life before you receive Jesus Christ. You ought to have to live there and gloat in it and talk about all the things you used to do before you got saved. You ought to be ashamed of them. For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and to the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word servant here means to enslave, to bring it in to, to be under the bondage of, and become or be made a servant. And the Lord wants us to be his servant. To enslave ourselves to him. Yield to him. Tell us what to do and we'll do it. That's what he wants. He also wants us to become the servant to all men. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As Paul is writing the Corinthian church here, he told them this in verse 19. He said, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. You see that? He wants us to be servant to all men. Look at the next verse, verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. 
to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Now, I'm glad he put that uh, statement right in the middle because when, you, when he said, to the Jews I go under the law so I can reach those that are under the law, that makes it sound like he's obeying God's law, right? And then when he said, those that are without the law, I become as those without the law. And now if he wouldn't have put this uh, parenthetical statement in here, and people still do it anyway, even with the statement in there, they said, see, this means that you go to the bar and drink with them, and you be like them so you can reach them. But no. When he said that, he also made this statement. Now listen to it again. Being not without law to God. Meaning, just because he was was with those that were without the law, the Gentiles, and trying to reach them for Christ, he didn't live without obeying God. He said, but under the law to Christ. That's the Holy Spirit leading him. That will never go against what the Lord wants. He said that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might be it by all means save some. So if we are servants of the Lord, then we will be servants to each other. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is what he's trying to do in our lives. That not, nobody thinks they're higher than someone else. That we esteem others more than ourselves. We see Paul here talking about giving up his personal rights, but not his responsibility to the Lord. Did you know you, you, have, you have personal rights you can give up? Yeah. But you're still responsible to the Lord. You still should obey the Lord. It's all done for the gospel's sake. Did you see his heart in this? If he could save some. He'll do anything he has to do without disobeying God that some might hear the gospel and be saved. It was for the gospel's sake. Servants. Servants. Don't ever think of yourself more than a servant. We should be the servant of God and not the servant of sin. The Lord wants us to become soul winners. Look in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. He wants us to become soul winners. The word become here means to cause to be, to become, grow, be made, or be wrought. When we leave our nets, like the disciples did, and follow the Lord, He will make us soul winners. He will make us fishers of men. What's your net? What's your net you have to leave in your life? The one thing that, that you can't leave to follow Jesus Christ. What's your net? Everybody's got a net. Are we going to leave it to follow Jesus Christ? If you want to be a soul winner, you've got to follow Jesus Christ. He will make you what you ought to be. But he's trying to make you become that. He's trying to make you become, become a witness to others who don't know Christ about what you've witnessed and He's done in your life. That's natural. That's naturally what He's doing. And if you'll follow Him, He'll make you a fisher of men. The Lord also wants us to become useful through His love. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, He tells us about this wonderful love that He's working in our lives. And He calls it charity there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The word charity here is talking about the love of God. God's love in our life. And that, by the way, this is speaking of us yielding to God and bearing his fruit that he produces through the Holy Spirit. So this is one of the things, that love that he has. Now, without the Lord's love, we're nothing. We're nothing. That's what verse 2 and 3, look at verse 2 and 3, it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, now this is hypothetical, though I have the gift of prophecy, pro, uh, prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, 
so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, take note, I am what? Nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Nothing. He wants his love to be used through us. Because without that, we're nothing. If we want to be useful to the Lord, then we must allow the Lord's love to shine through us. That means we have to be yielded to Him. That means we have to be becoming what He wants us to become. This is part of our life. Sanctification. Being like Him. And the Lord wants us to become mature believers. Look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 13. He said this, Paul, when he was writing here, he said, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Now that's natural. Okay? And then he said, But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That means he didn't speak anymore like a child. He didn't understand like a child. And he didn't think like a child. He was a man. And that means he matured. He didn't stay a little baby. And we were born into God's family by his power in John 1.12, like we read. We were born into his family as a baby. But we're supposed to grow and become more like the Lord every day. There is a maturation process. We're to mature. Listen, if one of my children were born and they stayed a two-year-old for their whole life, something's not right. Right? That's just not normal. That's not normal. And if someone is born again into God's family and they never mature and never grow, that's not normal. That's not where God wants us to be. We're not becoming what He wants us to be. Oh, He has so much more for you and me. That's why He saved us. He wants more for you than you want for you. He wants more for me than I want for myself. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. This is talking about the the functioning within the local church. And he says, And he gave, talking about the Lord, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, that means mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more, what? Children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, the Lord, in all things which is the head, even Christ. So we're not to be children. The whole purpose is to be taught, to grow in faith, to grow in the Word of God, to believe Him, not to be children anymore, tossed to and fro. You should know truth so that you're not deceived. And that's what happens when you mature. You know what the Word of God says. And so people who say things that aren't right, they don't toss you to and fro. You grow up in Him. You're stable. You have a foundation. And you know what to believe. And the Lord wants us to become effective communicators. By faith, we're to communicate our life to others, not just in words, but in everything we do. He's making us to become that. Look at Philemon with me. Philemon, chapter 1. Some of you got it. There's only one chapter in Philemon. Philemon, look at verse 4 and 5. I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. So we are to be living by faith so that when other people talk about us, it's affecting others in a positive way. Well, who was talking about them? Well, first of all, Paul was in his prayers, and it was affecting him in a positive way because every time he thought about them in verse 4... He said he was giving thanks to God for them. That's a positive thing. You can't give thanks to God for every person. 
Okay, there's some people you just don't give thanks to God for. Okay, now you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm thankful everybody's alive. I'm thankful God put people in my life. But you are thankful for some people. He was thankful here. And then he says not only is he thankful, and when he gave his prayers to God, he was thanking God, but he says, hearing of thy love and faith. Well, somebody had to tell him about them. So he was hearing about them, and it encouraged him. And it was encouraged him and it affected him in a positive way. I'm talking about effective communication. He's making us to become this way. That people aren't talking bad about us unless they, they hate God. And the world's not going to be our friends. But look at verse 6. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So we are to be living by faith so that when other people see our lives, that it affects them in a positive way. It says here that you're communicating your faith and it will become effectual, acknowledging every good thing that's within you. So whatever good's in you that God's putting in you, the good works that he's putting in you, they ought to come out. People ought to see them. They ought to be actions in your life. And when they see our lives, it affects them in a positive way because we are by faith communicating those things that God has given us. When other people talk about us, it should affect others in a positive way. And then in verse 7, it says, For we have, a, we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. So when we are living by faith, we live by faith so that when other people hear what we say, that it refreshes, or it, it refreshes them, but it affects them in a positive way. Because what was going on here, it said, thy, the joy and the consolation of thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So he was, the things he was, they were hearing about what was being said about them is refreshing. Does our lives communicate this? These are things that the Lord's trying, well, He did save us for, but He's trying now to sanctify us, and this is the life He's trying to get us to live, and He wants to live through us. Now, these are only a few things, but I'm asking you, are you becoming what the Lord saved you to be? Or something in your life hindering you? Is there a net in your life? Is there something that you have to get over? And the Lord will help you to get over that. He'll free you from it. He'll destroy that bondage because He doesn't want you to be in bondage but to anything but who? Him. So why wouldn't He help you with it? Why wouldn't He give you victory in it? If we'll yield ourselves to be servants to righteousness and not servants to sin, then the Lord will make us to become what He saved us to be. But we have to make up our minds, day in, day out, we want Him to guide us and to be our master. Father, please help us tonight. We'll never become what you want us to become by ourselves. There's no amount of work, there's no amount of list to keep and to do that will ever replace us having faith in you and yielding to you. So Father, guide us tonight as you've spoken to us. May we speak to you and yield to you and ask for your help. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you want to come and pray as the Lord's spoken to you tonight. That would be yielding to Him. As He spoke to you, say yes to Him. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm not 100% sure if I die tonight, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. No one looking around. There's some coming to the altar. But you say, Brother Justin, I'm not sure if I die tonight, I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm concerned about it. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that tonight would say, that's me. I've never been, I've never received and believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never been, become a son of God by faith. Anybody like that? Oh, we'd love to help you. Don't leave here lost tonight. That would be a horrible thing. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Jesus might come back tonight. You need to have eternal life. It's through Him. Believers, are you yielding to the Lord? 
Are you renewing your mind? Are you a servant of the Lord? Are you a servant to others? Now, you have to answer these. If you're not sure, I would talk to the Lord about it and ask Him to help you with this. Are you a soul winner? Meaning, are you conscious of other people's souls around you as you go through life? Are you useful to the Lord because you allow His love to shine through you? Are you useful? Are you a mature believer? I didn't say perfect. I said mature. When you sin, you recognize it, and you get that thing taken care of, and you draw close to God. Are you a mature believer? Does your life affect others in a positive way because of your faith? He wants to help you tonight. And listen, this is what we want as a church. We want you to believe the Lord for everything. We want you to become everything He saved you to be, which is a whole bunch. We want you to belong, and we'll talk about that next time. But this is what the Lord wants. Father, help us tonight. Seal these things in our hearts. I don't know how you've spoken, what you've spoken to us about. Maybe it's a net in our life that we won't follow you because we're going to hold on to that net. And Lord, it might be multiple nets in our life. Sometimes we don't even see the nets that we're tangled up in. And Would you please reveal those to us? Something that is hindering us from following you like, like we ought to, 100%. And when you do, Lord, would we yield to you and trust you with that? Oh, we need you tonight. We need your victory this week. We're looking for your coming. You want to change our vile bodies, Lord. You're the only one that can. We believe it. We believe you're coming. Help us to purify ourselves and, and to yield to you in this manner that we'll be more like you with your help. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make Him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.